In the very first episode of A Scary Home Companion, called All the Cannibals Fine, Young, and Otherwise, I told you the story of Nazino Island, also known as Cannibal Island. It's a desolate strip of land in the middle of a frigid Siberian river. This is a terrible event from history, in which many innocent lives were lost needlessly and horrifically. But I didn't tell you the whole story. At the time, I was a rookie. It was my first episode. I was a noob. I realized that I wasn't ready to spin such a dark narrative. And if I'm being candid, you weren't ready to hear it. So I gave you the sanitized version, the official find-it-on-Wikipedia version. Well, that was a hundred episodes ago. And now, I finally think that I'm ready to tell the story. Are you ready to hear it? For the first time, I will reveal what really happened on Cannibal Island. And everything that I know about the chosen son of the dark place called the End of Days. Drinking whiskey in the kitchen and telling scary stories around the fire. Music, monsters, and mayhem, killers, cannibals, and cults, fearful fiction and furious fact, tall tales, and terrible truths. This is a scary home companion. Although history views the events of Nazino Island as an unfortunate tragedy based on government prejudice, These events were, in fact, carefully orchestrated over the course of 30 years by a man named Ezra Dunwich. If that name sounds familiar at all, it's because you are a savvy listener. You remember his name from a story called The Profane Botanist. As a young man, Ezra Dunwich became obsessed with the legend about Hell's Gardener. He went so far as to form his own ghastly botanical society, and on a remote piece of farmland, they spent several years conducting profane experiments to blend flora and fauna into unspeakable hybrids. One night, round about 1897, A strange woman appeared at the farm. A woman who had intimate knowledge of their experiments. She claimed to be an emissary from another place. Dr. Dunwich was well acquainted with the tales of the ghastly ones and their island on the edge of hell's vast black ocean called the End of Days. But on this night, he learned they had also heard of him. They'd been watching him. Dunwich was smart. He was devoted. And they saw potential. But his work, this, was short-sighted. And they had other plans for him. 
What the emissary told him that night formed the basis for his work over the next 30 years, which would eventually lead him to the shores of Nizino Island. Soon after this conversation, he burned down his home, destroyed his experiments, killed his fellow botanists and friends, completely scorched the earth behind him so that he could forge a new path all on his own. Dunwich spent the next ten years wandering through Europe, building up his rep and engaging with every major occultist and mysticist along the way. At this time, belief in the occult and the dark arts was a current that ran through to even the highest levels of European society. Even the most modern of turn-of-the-century Europeans still had deep connections to the past, and the past is where shadows run deep and demons thrive. Dr. Dunwich had some degree of infamy due to his ghastly botanical society, and he used this to access members of the military, the police, the government, the arts. He made contacts, he amassed knowledge, he built wealth, and established his reputation. Finally, he moved east and into Russia. This plan of his took decades to enact, but he had patience. He even tried to savor the process as best he could, but he was still searching for the right location for his grand experiment. By all accounts, Ezra Dunwich was an odd-looking fellow. There are no known photographs of him, but by anecdotal description, he was intense and primitive-looking, with a heavy brow and an oversized jaw. More strangely, he was possessed of a barrel chest, a bulky, hairy torso, but the spindly arms and legs of a much smaller man. Dunwich was strong as an ox, there was no doubt about that, but he would still often wear a cloak in public to hide his oddly thin limbs. In Joseph Stalin's communist regime, just as in Europe, there was a strong belief in the occult. So, just as he had in Europe, Dr. Dunwich parlayed his reputation into a series of secret meetings and private dealings as a way to ingratiate himself with the communists. At this point, enough time had passed, he had finalized his plan. He had selected Nazino Island in Siberia as being so remote that there could be no chance of outside interference. With such scarcity of natural resources that the people trapped there would be utterly helpless against his grand design. Throughout this long, eclipsed time period, Dunwich was working on many parts of his plan all at once. Another important tentpole of the experiment involved his child. As fate would have it, his children. That night, so long ago, the emissary woman had told him many things, one of which was the importance of his offspring. He had never before considered having children. Why would he? But it was important for him to have a daughter. A daughter would help him finish the end game. Much to his chagrin, twins were born a daughter, and a son. Ezra thought about smothering the son right on the spot. Then he got a better idea. And by better, I mean worse. Much. Much worse. Dunwich raised the boy as his son. He raised the girl as their slave. 
she didn't know they were her family. She was raised from infancy to think that she was property. When the boy proved abusive, Ezra encouraged that behavior, praising him for it. And Ezra continued to manage his family in this fashion for a number of years, maintaining a constant atmosphere of pain and terror at all times. And then his government influence was finally rewarded. All the meetings, all the dealings, all the bribes. They selected Nazino as the place to ship the undesirables. In a few months' time, there would be a ship filled with thousands of them, mostly gypsies and Jews, who would be sent to Nazino Island. And Ezra Dunwich would be on that ship. There was only a few months before the sail date. With no time to waste, he summoned his son and his daughter and then stabbed the young man to death, ripping him to shreds without a word of explanation. He told the frightened girl that since his son was dead, he was now in need of a new son. At knife point, the girl joined him in eating the warm flesh of her brother. And then, also at knife point, they conceived a new son, one of pure lineage. Once she was well and truly along in her pregnancy, and the preparations for transport to the island were complete, Ezra decided to tell her the truth about who she was. And he did so just to gauge exactly how broken she was and if she had any fight left in her. As inhuman and evil as the ghastly ones are, in the case of Ezra Dunwich, they might have been punching above their weight class because this motherfucker was rotten to the core. When he told the girl the truth about who she was, that she had just eaten her brother and laid down with her father, she became hysterical. And he saw that there was still a person a spirit that was inside her, despite everything she had endured. And so, naturally, he lobotomized her. She was silent after that. Heavy with child, she joined her father on the refugee ship bound for Siberia. She watched on silently, with one hazel eye and one red eye, as he dumped the ship's rations and supplies into the frigid waters during the trip. And she didn't even make a peep when they finished their journey and stepped onto the shores of Cannibal Island. that last bit was upsetting. I just want to assure you that I will not be taking my foot off the gas pedal. We are going headlong into the heart of darkness. For 30 years, Ezra Dunwich had been collecting bits and pieces of ghastly history and arcane information, spells and hexes, combined with what 
the emissary had told him so long ago. He had chosen this path towards opening a breach to the end of days. It's hard to explain something that is so attendantly crazy. But in a nutshell, think of it as a decompression chamber. An airlock like they use in space shuttles and deep sea dives. If you are coming up to the surface from under a tremendous depth, you need to decompress to equalize the pressure in your body. Otherwise, your blood bends. The ghastly ones needed something similar. If he wanted to open a breach between here and there, first he had to equalize the environments. He needed to create a, a chamber, so to speak, a place that was commensurate with the end of days. Only then would the door open, and only then could the nightmare people enter our world at which point he could enter theirs and become one of them. As soon as he stepped foot on the beach of Nazino Island, Ezra Dunwich set about turning this desolate, isolated island into a little slice of hell on earth. He had gotten rid of most of the supplies during the trip, and with his brutish strength and shrewd intelligence... He monopolized the few supplies that were left. He turned people against one another. He encouraged murder, scavenging, and cannibalism. He did this through word and deed, pushing the panicked, starving, and freezing refugees into acts so savage they never would have thought themselves capable of it. And then he started to butcher the living, to trade the meat for favors. He sowed chaos and evil through pure iron will and ill intent and not for any personal gain other than a full belly. Just to reap destruction. To change the atmosphere of Nazino Island into something more horrible. More... Chaotic, more ghastly. Within a few weeks, he was a savage warlord, clad in skins and bones. The people around him atrophied and died, and yet his ample torso got ever thicker. He pushed farther, knowing no limits, seeking out every taboo and shred of human decency on the island and expunging it. As an act of kindness, both to you and myself, I will not go into the details of everything that he did. Trust me, you'd never be able to sleep, eat meat, or have sex ever again. Through it all, his daughter watched on mindlessly. She was catatonic, oblivious to what surrounded her, locked into her own personal hell. When it was ready, when all hope had been extinguished, when everyone was either dead or so badly damaged in body and soul that they would carry that darkness with them wherever they went forever. When Nazino Island had truly become hell on earth, then Dunwich enacted the old spells and rituals that he had learned. He ripped open a breach between our world and the end of days. His plan worked, paid off to perfection, and the ghastly ones emerged onto Nazino Island to hunt the weakened and broken survivors. 
they all came. The bickering butchers, the effigy, the baby doll, the mirror man, the surgeon, the long black veil, festering John, the woman with the split mouth, the faceless bishop, Tonton Makut, the butterfly woman, even his idol, his inspiration, the profane botanist. The night throbbed with blood. Screams echoed in the snowfall. Ezra Dunwich grabbed his daughter and dragged her along with him up to the breach to turn her in and claim his reward so that he could take a seat at the ghastly table. The skin weaver, the oldest of the nightmare people, was waiting for him. Together with the surgeon, they held down Ezra Dunwich to give him everything that he deserved. They removed his jaw, his teeth, his genitals, his arms. And then they took pieces from the dead, the half-eaten bodies Ezra himself had ravaged, and they took parts. More arms. Children's arms, all bent backward at the elbow. A dozen additional legs stitched together into a crude centipede tail. An undersized mandible set inside an oversized one. And then stitched back into place on his jaw with bone needles and long, thin strands of muscle tissue for thread. The faceless bishop returned. He brought a face freshly peeled from the skull of a living victim and applied it to Ezra's hairy chest. The face stuck, flesh bonding with gooey flesh, and the open, peeled mouth started to wail for food. The bishop cackled and went to hunt for more faces. The skin weaver and the surgeon marveled at their work. They had truly outdone themselves. They had transformed this monstrous human being into a patchwork demon that reflected his soul. He would be called the Ravenous One. The breach between worlds was short-lived. As the universe started to knit itself back together, this pantheon of dark gods returned to their home island, dragging little bits and pieces of humanity with them to the end of days. When only the skin weaver was left, she took the pregnant girl by the hand and walked her out of our world and into the next. The pregnant girl wept tears of red from her left eye. Since she had been lobotomized, it's unclear how much she understood of her surroundings. But we can hope and pray that her faculties were diminished enough to spare her from the intensity of the terrors to come. She walked hand in hand with the skin weaver. The woman was impossibly old and frail, 
translucent gray skin mottled with sores, clinging tightly to gnarly, twisted bones. She wore layers upon layers of clothing, all made by hand at her spinning wheel, with the skins of the dead. The skin weaver talked softly to the girl, not in words, but in ragged sighs and the dry clicks of a withered black tongue against broken teeth. They walked across the narrow beach. There was a warmth coming up through the sand of powdered tooth and bone, a steady throbbing from far below. In the distance, there was a reef of wreckage in a broken loop around the shallow, dark water of the island. Smashed and broken remains of boats and planes mixed in with the accumulated flotsam and jetsam of centuries. The water here was flat, no tides, and yet it moved ever so slightly when shapes rose to the surface for a glimpse of the beach. Misshapen heads, waterlogged limbs, they all turned to the girl as she walked. Some ways down the beach, Tonton Makut set his gunny sack down on the sand. Inside was a fresh harvest. A pack of scrawny, Feral children scurried out of the saw-blade ferns that lined the edge of the beach. Tonton Makut dumped warm meat on the ground, and the children sat upon it. He laughed as they ate. The skin weaver and the pregnant girl left the beach behind. They moved inland through the swinging saw-blade ferns and over a narrow trench lined with red vines and filled with a thick, chunky green goop that smelled of sewage and rot, but glittered a dull green. They passed through a stand of grotesque trees, ones with thick, meaty trunks made of stacked human torsos, hacked limbless, stitched together crudely, long since grown and healed together with skin and scar. Crooked, doughy trees with pale flesh for bark that wept stomach acid tears and oozed green-black sap through their pores. Just through the trees, the neat little rows of the organ orchards were visible. Flowers bloomed black and ghoulish fruit hung heavily from branches like blood-swollen testicles on the verge of rupture. The orchards lay to the left, but the skin weaver led the girl to the right towards the tall rock spire at the center of the island. It rose some two hundred feet into the slate-gray sky, but at the base it was very wide, and the sides of the rock were riddled with caves and cracks. Each of the caves was its own private nightmare theater, with its own special host, and its own revolving cast of tortured guests. Here was the operating room for the surgeon. One wall was lined with hundreds of dirty jars filled with moving, staring human eyeballs. Here was the boudoir of the baby doll as she danced her seductive striptease of flesh over the top of a cringing, screaming man. Here, a man sat in his car with a gun in his lap. The bickering butchers were in the back seat, their entrails piled between them as they shouted horrible things into his ears from either side. Here, in this cave, an art studio, 
were a panicked girl painted on an easel while the butterfly woman danced around her, fluttering her wings of skin and meat. One cave was lined with mirrors, the next filled with toxic, egg-laying maggots, the next adorned with fire. They were all way stations for wandering souls, traps set for dreamers so the ghastly ones could ply their trade and carve away human sanity in chunks and pieces. Beyond the caves, there was a mighty cleft in the stone base of the spire. It zigzagged halfway up the rock and split into the earth below. They weren't steps, but the cracked rocks broke downward, and across the tops of these descending jags, a footpath had been worn down over the centuries. Thousands of boots and feet throughout the year, so many humans going below to what waited for them beneath the rock. The walls were close. They were moist and sandpaper rough to the touch. The skin weaver and the pregnant girl went down, deeper and deeper, until the darkness that eclipsed them was utter and complete. Only then did they see the green glow throbbing, pulsing, ugly emerald green light rising and falling. The crack opened up into a cavern, a chamber a hundred feet across, filled with a putrid black liquid. Eh, not a liquid. An ooze. Gelatinous. This clotted seepage was the source of the light, bioluminescent light. For this was not a liquid, nor an ooze. This little pond deep under the rock was a writhing mass of slugs, crawling, wriggling, brain tumor slugs in such vast numbers that each of them was like a drop in a lake, a living lake of single-celled organisms. Skinweaver let go of the girl's hand and pushed her into the pool, which surged upward to embrace her. She was grabbed and pulled under the surface by a warm, slimy tide. It enveloped her, embraced her, kissed her, explored her, invaded her through every orifice at once. The slugs filled her lungs, but she did not drown. One of them nestled into her brain, others amidst her organs, and one of them wormed its way deeply enough into her belly that it found the greatest prize of all. A human brain, fully developed but unborn. A completely raw psyche, a blank page as this tumor crawled and settled in between the folds of the gray matter, the baby started to move. The invasion of so many slugs was pushing the baby boy down the birth canal. The warm tide of glowing green-black ooze raised the newborn baby to the surface. The skin weaver picked him up, 
she chewed off the umbilical cord and dropped it so that dozens more slugs could slither into it, flooding into the girl's belly, filling it to capacity. The skin weaver cradled the precious baby in her arms and watched as his mother was reborn from the muck. The ghastly ones were not often given the gift of fresh, living human flesh. So they made the most of their bounty. The girl's brain was far too damaged to host an emissary and send her back out into the world, so they found a new use for her as a new member of the Ghastly Ones. Among the Nightmare People, she would be known as the Pregnant Woman, her belly forever taut, swollen to the point of splitting wide open and swimming with hundreds of tumors. Together, the skin weaver, the pregnant woman, and the newly born Ira Dunwich made their way to the surface. Ira Dunwich was taken from the island that very day, returned to the world with the bookman, where he was raised by a series of emissaries. Over the years, they taught him what a person was supposed to be, and he taught them what an emissary was supposed to be. Ira was different from the other emissaries. They shared the commonality of the dark passenger inside of their brains, but he was special. Every human being has a unique psyche and an equally unique brain chemistry. So an emissary bonding with the human brain could have markedly different outcomes. Some minds were more receptive easier to manipulate, while others struggled or rebelled or even shut down. The results were wildly unpredictable. This was a once-in-a-lifetime occurrence, a complete and total bond between parasite and host in which neither has any concept of life without the other. There was no mental combat. No exploitation of insanity or weakness. There were no bargains to make. To share control. The two grew as one. And into one. Completely harmonious. His bond with the island was stronger than that of the other emissaries. They could all communicate with the end of days while the host slept, but Ira Dunwich was in constant communication. His mind could fully utilize the gestalt and even tap into the consciousness of other emissaries in certain cases. Growing up, all of his darkest desires and thoughts were indulged. Nothing was sacred. He'd shattered every taboo, committed every heinous crime and act of cruelty known to man before he had come of age. Ira was naturally charismatic, a leader among his own kind, and also among the fevered minds of the cultists. He was a recruiter, a politician who built bridges towards the goals of the end of days. He provided new sources of pain and suffering and madness and meat. Oh, yes, the meat. 
The island fed in many ways. It needed fresh souls and fresh nightmares, but it also needed bodies, blood and bone to build new creations and nightmare people. Ira made sure the island was well fed. And he always paid proper tribute to the ravenous one, that thing that used to be his father, as well as the pregnant woman and the skin weaver. But he ate first. He took the choicest cuts for himself. In time, he sought out the woman who was considered to be the most evil woman on earth. Her name was Lila Ambrose, and she was so merciless and bloodthirsty that most people thought she must already be an emissary, just like her father had been. They courted this prince and princess of the ghastly faith. He became so enamored of her that causing her misery seemed to be the best way to express that. Ira was not capable of forming human connections as we know them. So his fondness for Lila was more like that of an insane child and their favorite toy. And with that in mind, Ira wanted to fuck up that toy as badly as possible, beat it and mangle it and ruin it, and then throw it away so that no one else could ever play with it. Lila Ambrose, as faithful a servant of the ghastly ones as ever had been, was shunned. Her life's work cast aside, and she was dismissed for no other reason than it amused Ira to watch her suffer. As much as he enjoyed torturing children and feasting on their screams and then sucking on their teeth, which he kept as souvenirs, and he really did enjoy those things, Ira realized that the pain generated from betrayal tasted so much sweeter. He and Lila feuded for years, And even after her bitterness and disappointment had galvanized into razor-sharp fury and hate, she still always gave him a little thrill. She was responsible for him spending so many years on death row trapped in cell six. While inside, he had become acquainted with the young priest named Frank Rourke. He had also started a brief but memorable interaction with the DRO. It's a government agency that wanted him to help them out with some experiments. Under the watch of Ira Dunwich, ghastly cults had proliferated. There were more of them than ever before and in larger congregations. The ghastly gospel was ringing forth and broken souls around the world were answering the call. Then Lila Ambrose finally found a way to really hit back at him, and the island. She turned snitch and gave up all of her secrets to the paramilitary religious order called Nemesis. This religious order had been around for centuries. But up until now, they'd always been more of an irritant than a legitimate threat. But with the help of Lila Ambrose and the priest Frank Rourke, the pious mercenaries of Nemesis sought to obliterate everything that Ira Dunwich had built. They were damn successful. They took out Dozens of the largest ghastly cults, many of their most valuable leaders, and a great many emissaries. 
Things got so bad that Ira Dunwich had to return to the end of days as his only true sanctuary. Much to his dismay, he found that the end of days no longer felt like home to him. He'd gone out into the world and returned, metaphorically speaking, to his childhood bedroom to find it confining and juvenile. So he went back to the world, where he took a new role. Now he was to be a mentor, a teacher, a guide. He would pass messages between the other emissaries and help them coordinate mass efforts and enact complex plans. But he was mostly retired. This was a consulting gig. Ira wanted to spend more time with children. Frank Rourke and Nemesis had taught Ira Dunwich one very valuable lesson, one that previously he thought he was immune from. He learned that he could be afraid. He learned that there was an end for everyone, even him. He took several protégés under his wing through the years, trying to ensure that the next waves of emissaries and cults alike would be as powerful as they could be. But he also stopped to enjoy the roses. Although in his case it wasn't roses, it was quivering flesh and piercing screams and the satisfying crunch of baby teeth in his mouth, but you get the point. Until one day, priest. That priest, that motherfucking cock-sucking, asshole, son of a bitch, goody, two-shoes, sell of it, sack of shit, priest Frank Rourke found him. Found him hidden away in his Florida retirement community. After destroying so much of Ira's work, the priest was not done yet and he took from Ira Dunwich what he held most dear. He took his very essence. Frank Rourke smashed open the skull of Ira Dunwich and gave the tumor within a new host. Although it was very common for these slugs to inhabit the brains of the insane, In this case, it was the emissary itself that had gone insane. Thank you for listening to this ultra-dark and super-disgusting episode of A Scary Home Companion. Find the show on social media, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can contact the show directly at ascaryhomecompanion at gmail.com. There are a lot of ways that you can support the show by listening, subscribing, leaving a review, You could tie up a friend and force them to listen. That would help. Or, a little easier, sign up for the Patreon. You get trivia, behind-the-scenes, inside scoop, bonus episodes. Listen, you've listened to 100 episodes. Why not listen to the other four that are available exclusively on Patreon? This episode was produced and edited by Jeff Davidson. Featured music by Daniel Birch, with Boat to the Island. John Badger and the Mustache Riders of Doom with Brave New World. Diogenes in Hell with Abyssal Tides Collapse. Marco and Mikey with Retarded Lullaby. Masanek with Bark of Insanity. Chelsea Oxendine with Lila is Grown. 
and the show theme music. A Scary Home Companion has grown a lot over a hundred episodes. It hardly even sounds like the same show. I can't tell you where the next 100 episodes will take us, but we are walking this dark and twisted path together, you and I, and so we will learn. We will find out where it goes. Season 9 is coming soon.